Please turn with me to John 21. We'll be verses 1 through 14. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee. And two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, Children, do you have any fish? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there was so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Jens Ovison was fishing. He was fishing for salmon in central Norway's Gala River when he was swept away by the strong current. Kel Wilhelmsen, 55 years old, spotted the man's struggle, and Wilhelmsen ran across the bridge waiting for Ovison as the current carried him downriver. Wilhelmsen later told the newspaper, he seemed paralyzed. Only his face and the tips of his boots were above the water, so I decided to start casting. His homemade lure hooked Ovison on the very first cast at about 10 meters away. But Ovison weighed nearly 250 pounds, and Wilhelmsen tried every trick he knew to reel in this big man without breaking his light line. And he landed the fish. <laughs> or landed the man and hauled him onto the shore and Ovison survived the or ordeal. Kel Wilhelmsen was a literal fisher of men, at least for one day. The disciples of Jesus were called to be fishers of men in a different sense, of course. But now, as we turn to John 21, they're back fishing again but they're fishing for fish. The scene in John 21 reminds us of the scene all the way back in Matthew chapter 4 at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. These men who would later then become the disciples were fishing for fish. They weren't catching many. And Jesus calls them to follow him and he says, I will make you fishers of men. And in Luke chapter 5, whether it's the same 
incident or, or maybe a different one. It records Jesus being in the boat with Simon Peter and James and John. And as he's done teaching to those on the shore, he tells them who had been fishing to cast your net on the other side of the boat. And they let down the net and they caught so many fish that it broke the nets. And Jesus tells them to fear not. From now on, you'll be catching people. But now, we fast forward three years in John 21, and they're back at the very same body of water, the Sea of Tiberias, which is also called the Sea of Galilee. And we see some of the same disciples struggling again, and Jesus is coming to them again. And you might think to yourself as you start to put the pieces together, well, some things just come full circle in life. People always go back to where they came from. Some things never change. And in some ways that's true. But in some accounts, like this one, the result ends up being rather different. John 21 is what we call a living parable. Parables in the Bible are stories that Jesus told that have spiritual principles attached to them. John 21 is a living parable in that the interactions of the disciples and the boat and the fish and the Lord really happened, but they also point us to some spiritual principles, some lessons that are not just for the 12 themselves to learn, but that lessons for everyone to learn, all the followers of Jesus, including you, including me. And the question that is posed to us from the very beginning of this living parable is what are you fishing for? We see that the disciples are fishing for fish. And they're toiling with no results in this endeavor because they have forgotten their purpose. It's hard to know why, really, that they've returned to the Sea of Galilee. This is among the area of the Gentiles. Some Bible scholars think that the sign that the disciples went back to fish for fish is a sign that they're abandoning their faith. That, that, that maybe the pressure of following Jesus was too much. Maybe the persecution was upon them. A after all, why else would somebody who'd been following Jesus for three years, someone who had heard the teaching, someone who had seen the miracles, someone who had witnessed the death and the burial and even the resurrection, why would somebody like that go back to their job. Maybe it's a sign that they're losing faith. I don't think that's the case. I mean, after all, these disciples had just seen the resurrected Lord, not once, but twice. Their eyes were open to the fact that he fulfilled the prophecies of the Messiah. They rejoiced at his coming and wondered in awe at his resurrected form. They received the Holy Spirit that he breathed upon them and the commission that he sent to them to go out. So they believed in the Lord. They heard what he wants them to do. But here's the rub. They don't really feel like they know how to do it. And so what do they do? Well, they go back and do the thing that they've always done. You can relate to that. I can relate to that. Sometimes maybe you, you know the thing that the Lord would have you to do. Maybe it's to shed a particular sin that you're holding on to. Maybe you know the Lord would have you change the nature of a relationship that you have with someone. Maybe you know that the Lord would definitely have you to share the good news of the gospel, of hope and forgiveness and life with a friend or a coworker. You know that's what God wants you to do, but you feel paralyzed in doing it. And so, as a result, you do nothing about it, and perhaps you just keep doing what you've always done. You go fishing for fish. So the disciples are fishing all night long. Every fisherman knows that the best time to catch fish is in the evening and in the morning, 
And the same is true in the Sea of Galilee. And so hour after hour, the disciples cast their nets and they wait and they retrieve. And they cast and they wait and they retrieve. And they cast and they wait and they retrieve. There was a lot of toil, but no results. These disciples had no effectiveness in the task at hand. And we see two things here in the living parable. We see that the work that they've chosen doesn't have a lot of meaning to it compared to what they've been called to. And the work that they've tried to accomplish has no success. And there's some lessons there for us. They're supposed to be fishing for men. (laughs) They're supposed to be doing the work of evangelism. And so are we. The followers of Jesus are given a purpose. The purpose is to proclaim the excellencies of the Lord that more might believe in him and experience him and have life in his name. It takes great effort to engage in this purpose, but the power for it does not come from us. And we see that in the story. Jesus is watching from the shore. He sees their struggle and their lack of effectiveness and he calls out to them. You can picture the scene, right? They're out a hundred yards off of shore. The sun is just starting to come up on the horizon. There's this beautiful pink and orange glow that is starting to come over the water. The temperature's changing and the fog is starting to lift off the face of the sea. And they hear the voice. Have you caught any fish? And the miracle here is that the fishermen told the truth. They're fishermen after all. Fishermen don't like to tell the truth, especially about fish. They don't like to tell if they're catching nothing. And they certainly don't like to tell you the spot if they're catching everything. But these fishermen, these disciples hear the word from the shore, not recognizing that it is from the Lord himself, and they honestly tell him that they've caught nothing. Similar to Luke chapter 5, Jesus repeats the lesson. Cast the net to the other side of the boat. The disciples didn't remember the lesson. It was three years ago. Now, I don't know about you, but if I've been fishing all night, And some stranger called out to me, don't cast the net right here, but cast it just six or seven feet this way over here after I've been toiling all night with no effectiveness. There's some pretty bad thoughts going through my mind in that moment. But sometimes when you've been ineffective, you get desperate. And so, just like in Luke 5, the disciples move the net. And just like in Luke 5, the disciples catch an overflow of fish. And the fish indicate the mission that they're supposed to be on, the mission for souls. And in fact, when they obey Jesus, it shows that he empowers them for the mission. There's a spiritual principle at play here. It's one that Jesus had taught them already. And now he's teaching them again. We saw it last in John chapter 15. You remember Jesus is orienting his disciples for life with God, for effectiveness in life, for spiritual nearness and intimacy with God, for a life that bears fruit, that doesn't just feel stagnant, that doesn't look like it's dead, a life that is enlivened. And he says to them in John chapter 15, if you want that kind of life, abide in me And I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Now we're starting to see the principle in the parable. The disciples worked hard, but they were ineffective and they received nothing in return. 
Then the disciples heard the voice of Jesus, obeyed it, and the return was abundant in its nature. To abide means to remain. To abide means to actively, Christian, foster faith and trust by remaining in Jesus. And this, in turn, leads to obedience and to our purpose. The disciples were in the boat, but they were not abiding. They were muddling their way through their task. And as a result, they received nothing. But the presence of Jesus and the response to him in obedience made everything change. You know, some of us go through life and we want to serve the Lord. We love the Lord. We recognize the grace that God gives us. But when it comes to abiding and obedience and action, we never do anything. (laughs) I can't tell you, I've met hundreds and hundreds of people in this category. People who truly love the Lord, but do nothing by way of living out their faith. There's a story of a town where all of the residents of the town are ducks. And every Sunday, the ducks waddle out of their houses and they waddle down Main Street to their church. And they waddle into the sanctuary and they squat in their proper pews. And the duck choir waddles in and it takes its place. And then the duck minister comes forward and opens the duck Bible. And he reads to them, Ducks, God has given you wings. With wings, you can fly. With wings, you can mount up and soar like eagles. No walls can confine you. No fences can hold you. You have wings. God has given you wings, and you can fly like the birds. And all of the ducks shout, Amen! And then they all waddle back home. Some of us are Christians who never fly because we just don't step out and really do anything. Conversely, there are some people who serve the Lord actively and diligently, but they do not rely on his strength and his power and therefore they are ineffective. They don't abide. For some of us, when there is a challenge in front of us, our instinct is to lower our head and to work harder and to try harder and to push through. And hard work like that can be very, very effective in life. It's a great character trait to have, hard work. But this is not how effectiveness is sought in the kingdom of God. Effectiveness in God's economy comes upon reliance on the power that Jesus alone gives. Once upon a time, there was an old well that stood outside the front door of the family farmhouse in New Hampshire. The water from this well was remarkably cold and pure. And no matter how hot the summer was and how severe the drought was, the well always was a source of refreshment and joy. The faithful old well stood for years until eventually the farmhouse was modernized. Wiring brought in electric lights, indoor plumbing brought in cold and hot running water. And the old well was no longer needed. And so it was sealed for use for possible future emergencies. But one day, years later, someone had a hankering for the cold, pure water of that familiar old well. And so he unsealed the well and he lowered the bucket for a nostalgic taste of that delightful refreshment that he remembered from his childhood. And he was shocked to discover 
that the well that had once survived the severest of droughts was bone dry. Perplexed, he asked some of the older neighbors who knew about such things, and he learned that wells of that sort were fed by hundreds of tiny underground rivulets which seep a steady flow of water. And as long as water is drawn out of the well, new water will flow through the rivulets, keeping the well open for more of a flow. But when the water stops flowing, the rivulets clog with mud and they close up. The well dried up because it was used, not because it was used too much. <laughs> the well dried up because it wasn't used enough. When you draw from the well of Jesus' power in your life, here's the amazing thing. It never runs out. <laughs> he continues to give you more. He continues to give you more. He continues to give you more and more soul-nourishing, obedience-producing, affection-altering nourishment and power. When you draw from the well of the resurrection power of Jesus, he continues to give you more. He continues to give you more and more that overflows into an effectiveness in fishing for men. But if you never draw from it, you will toil and your effectiveness will be minimal. So we see that the disciples, upon their act of obedience, they move the net, they rely on the word of the Lord, and immediately there's a massive haul of fish. Verse 6 says, so they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. And finally, in verse 11, when they did, Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them, and although there were so many, the net was not torn. Now, the number 153 doesn't mean anything particular that we can decipher, but it illustrates the fact that they caught a lot of fish. <laughs> if you catch 153 fish in a day with a fairly small boat and a medium-sized net, that is a lot of fish. And it says that these are large fish in their nature. But what's really interesting here is that the net didn't break. Do you notice that detail? And it points to the reality that when you are engaged in God's work of evangelism, people will come to Christ. People will come to the Lord. God will accomplish his work. The number of the kingdom will expand, and not just expand by a small amount. The number of the kingdom will expand by a very large amount. It's like the mustard seed that begins as one of the smallest of seeds and becomes one of the largest plants in the garden, Jesus says. There'll be room in the kingdom for everyone who trusts Jesus for their salvation. The net of God will not break. Now that is really good news if you are really discouraged about your sin and your worthiness before God. Because I can't tell you how many people I've talked to over the years that say, why would God love me? Why would God want to save me? Why would God want to make room for me? He should make room for that person or that person or that person, but not for me. The net of God will never break. And there is room for you in his kingdom. The story comes to its conclusion as the disciples come to the beach with Jesus. The coal fire is ready. There's a breakfast of fish and of bread that's being served. The disciples, you would think after seeing miracle after miracle and conversion after conversion and death and burial and resurrection would, you think that they'd become accustomed to these sort of supernatural things, but they're in awe again. None of them dared to ask him, who are you? <laughs> they knew it was the Lord. 
And Jesus was again providing for these disciples in breakfast. And yet this time, he asks them to participate in the provision. He has bread and fish, and yet verse 9, he tells them to go and get some of the fish that they caught and bring it to this feast as well. He provides for them, but now they are participating in a different way because they're the ones who received the power of the Holy Spirit. They are the ones who are now going to do the work of God on earth. They are the ones who have access to the resurrection power that brings new life to people by sharing the good news for forgiveness of sins. And therefore, some of the fish that they just caught must be brought to this table. Jesus reminds his disciples of their purpose, of their power, and of their provision. That's what we see in this parable. And you might say that the effective Christian life comes in the purpose and the power and the provision that only Jesus provides. You surely want to live an effective Christian life. One of the biggest struggles for so many of us is that when we go through periods of dryness, we feel like our spiritual apathy is what rules the day. You ever wonder why that is? You ever wonder why you go through long seasons where you just feel like, oh, I'm not doing anything. I don't feel the nearness of God. I believe in Jesus. I believe he rose from the dead. I believe he forgives me for my sins, but I have no, no joy, no effectiveness, no excitement. Maybe it's because you've altered your gaze off of your purpose. Or maybe it's because you're not relying on Jesus' power. Or maybe you're not accessing his provision. But the effective, the joy-produced Christian life comes in the purpose and the power and the provision that Jesus himself gives. Of course, the living parable is not just for these disciples. The living parable is for all Christians. And so we ask the question, Christian, do you understand your purpose, do you? In this life, as you look at your whole life and you look at a paradigm for living, do you understand your purpose? To proclaim the excellencies of the Lord Jesus and thus glorify God with your life through faith in him and faithfulness to him? And that faithfulness to him means that you participate in his work in the world through engaging other people. (laughs) Transferring them from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of the sun and transforming them into the likeness of that sun. Faithfulness has an evangelistic component of it. It's interesting, isn't it, that right after the resurrection, the pinnacle, we see this parable. You know, if you're a Christian, your purpose in this life is not your job. It's not. I think in our time today, we often think that our purpose is our job. God made me good at a specific thing, and so I'm going to do that, and it's going to be good for the people in our community, and it's going to be good for my family as I provide. But your purpose is not to fish for fish. Your purpose is to fish for men. So doctor or lawyer or truck driver or watchmaker... That's not your purpose. A good friend of mine who is a medical doctor once said to me while I was thanking him, he had spent a significant amount of time working with a person in our previous church, a person who had some needs and needed guidance and encouragement and direction, and and he had a very busy medical practice, and so I thanked him for taking out his time to do that. And he said to me, I'm almost astonished, well, of course, This is why I'm here. (laughs) This is my purpose. All the other stuff that I do, well, that's just to make money. Cares. I mean, I need that for my family and to provide for 
them, but this is my reason for being here, to serve the Lord by serving other people. That's the purpose of a Christian, to fish for men. Christian, do you understand your power that you don't accomplish this work on your own, but that your life is a life that is looked at as a vessel by which God puts his power in and through you for the sake of other people. You wake up in the morning and say, God, how do you want to use me today? God, show me the ways that you want to use my time, talent, and effort for the sake of your glory and for your kingdom. That's what it means to fish for fish. And this power comes from Jesus himself. It happens when you abide in him. You need to only exercise a modicum of willingness and a modicum of courage. And God will use even you to do great things. Effectiveness comes in the purpose and the power and the provision of the Lord Jesus. And do you understand your provision, Christian? Do you understand that through the ups and the downs and the lefts and the rights and the struggles and the temptations and even the sins and then the victories of your life that Jesus will provide for you? What a wonderful thought. That the one who has all of the resources of eternity provides for you according to the pleasure of his will. And so I need to ask you, what are you fishing for? Are you fishing for fish or are you fishing for men? There's a principle that's called the 80,000 fold influence. You may have heard it before. Let's say that a person meets an average of two or three people a day. And assuming the average lifespan is nearly 80 years old, that's means that the average person will encounter somewhere between 60,000 and 80,000 people over the course of their life. Heinz Field in Pittsburgh, the home of the Pittsburgh Steelers, seats 68,400 people. First Energy Stadium in Cleveland, the home of the Cleveland Browns, seats just under 68,000. Imagine if you walked into the stadium of the team of your choice at the end of your life, And one by one, the seats are filled with old and strangely familiar faces, memories flooding back to you until the crowd starts to pour onto the field. You've met each person here, though many were only for a single moment. Each person represents at least one opportunity that you had to influence the trajectory of a life. Your life will impact the world through thousands of other lives who in turn will impact millions of other lives if you think about your life in terms of other people. What would you say to each person now that you had a chance? What would you say to your mother? What would you say to your high school boyfriend? What would you say to the custodian who held the door open for you at work last week? What are you fishing for? Are you fishing for fish? Or are you fishing for men? You know, someone fished for you sometime. You realize that? Think about walking into that stadium and seeing all the people that you have the opportunity to fish for. Conversely, think about going into the stadium of the one who fished for you. (laughs) Maybe it was a parent. Maybe it was a neighbor. Maybe it was your Sunday school teacher. What are you fishing for? Are you fishing for fish? Or are you fishing for men? Let's fish for men. Please pray with me. 
Father, it's amazing to us that as we see the proximity of this living parable to the resurrection of Jesus, that immediately following this significant event, he again redirects his followers. He redirects us. Coming off the celebration of Easter Sunday, he redirects us back to the focus on other people. God, help us to be other people focused. God, help us to think of our lives not just in terms of what we get for us, but what you want to do through us for the sake of others. Help us not to go through life dry and stagnant, doing nothing. Help us to be ducks who fly. Help us to be fishermen who fish, not just for fish, but who fish for men. God, give us joy and courage. God, we recognize that we need to rely on your power and that we need to learn ever more to do that. And so we ask for that now, for our good and for your glory. Amen. The call to fish for men is a call to live a life that has eternal consequence. It's a call to live a life that gives you many, many benefits. It's the most exciting life. It's the most fulfilling life. You'll experience the greatest power of God and the greatest nearness of God. But you'll never experience all of those things unless you actually commit to that purpose, to fish for men. And so I want to encourage you today to go ahead and make that choice, to say, I want to live a life that's focused on other people for the sake of the glory of God. And when you do, you will not be disappointed. Hear these good words from 2 Thessalonians as our benediction. It says, now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. God bless you as you go.